looking at the rebellion of Korach, when Korach rebels, the man whose prayer God will answer. The man, or as the case may be, the woman whose prayer that God will answer. Look with me, please, to Jude's epistle. We'll begin in verse 10. But these men revile the things which they do not understand. And the things which they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals, by these things they are destroyed. Woe to them, for they've gone the way of Cain. For pay they have rushed headlong into the era of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korach. The first thing we see about these people is their character and their nature, spiritually and psychologically. Jude's epistle deals centrally with the subject of false brethren, of backsliders or false believers in the church. It describes their patterns of behavior. It tells us how they operate, how to identify them. And the first thing we see is they don't understand. They don't understand in the sense of biblical understanding. Biblical understanding requires the illumination of the Holy Spirit. Biblical understanding requires the illumination of the Holy Spirit. These people, the things they know, they do not know by the Spirit. They only know two-dimensionally. Remember, animals have two dimensions. They have a body and a soul, separate words in Greek and Hebrew. In Hebrew, they have a goof and a nephesh. In Greek, they have a soma and a suke. But when people become Christians, humans are three-dimensional. We also have a spirit, a spirit. Our spirit is called ruach in Hebrew, and it is called uh, pneuma in Greek. But it's spiritually dead. People have a spirit, but it is dead until they are born again. When they are regenerate, they have a body that's alive, a soul that's alive, and a spirit that's alive, while animals will only have a body and a consciousness, a soul. These people are two-dimensional. Darwinists try to say we're simply apes with better DNA. That's what they tried to say. We're simply apes with better DNA. That is the first problem with secular psychology. Secular psychology says we are simply apes with better DNA. Well, in their case, they're right. Anybody who believes Darwinism must be related to a baboon. But anyway, <laughs> we always point this out, and we pointed this out here in South Africa a number of times. Paul says, know ye not, you're a temple of the Holy Spirit. We're a box in a box in a box. That's the nature of man, a temple. This is the outer court. There was an outer court. Even non-Jews, even pagans, could see the outer court. The outer court corresponds to our physical body. Everybody can see it. In Greek, this would be called soma. Hebrew, goof. Okay. But then there was the holy place, the inner court, where the priests, the Levites, would go. Okay? That was different. This inner court is the inner man or inner woman, but not innermost. Inner court. This inner court corresponds to the soul. In Greek, psuche, we get the word psychology. Okay? In Hebrew, it would be called nephesh. Nephesh. It's what in English we would call onomatopoeia. The word sounds like what it is. <sighs> Respiration. <sighs> nephesh. <sighs> okay. But then we have the innermost man or innermost woman. That is referred to metaphorically in the New Testament as our heart. You ask Jesus into your heart. If you can believe it in the Old Testament, the innermost man is referred to as, usually, the kidney, kleot. In Old Testament terms, you'd ask Jesus into your kidneys. This is the Holy of Holies, where God's spirit dwelt, where the Shekinah was, okay? That's the Holy of Holies, the sanctum sanctorum, the place of divine presence. Again, a completely different term. In Hebrew, it would be called ruach. 
The Holy Spirit is the Ruach Kodesh, the Spirit of Holiness. In Greek, this would be called pneuma, as in pneumonia or pneumatic drill. Pneuma, okay? The relationship between the body and soul. If you are physically ill, it can affect your attitude. You wake up with a fever. You don't feel too good psychologically, emotionally, okay? On the other hand, if you're under a lot of stress, you're stuck in a traffic jam on the way to an important business meeting, and your blood pressure goes through the roof, what's happening psychologically can affect what we are physiologically. There's a close relationship. Is that illness psychosomatic, or is there something organically wrong? Well, <laughs> or is it both? The same thing is true of the relationship between the spirit and the soul. Is the Holy Spirit really giving that person a prophecy, or is it their own imagination? <laughs> is that a real tongue? Is that a real word of knowledge? Where does the spirit begin and the soul end? Now, we have tapes dealing with this. It, Hebrew says it's like the relationship between um, marrow Right? Bone and marrow. But from Hebrews 4.12. The point is, animals are only two-dimensional. They can behave as physical beings and as psychological beings. They have behavioral patterns based on instinct. Humans, once they're born again, can behave tridimensionally. Unsaved people behave bidimensionally. They're spiritually dead. They do not function in the spiritual realm to function in the spiritual realm, you must be energized by a spirit. That will either be the Holy Spirit, or in the case of an unsaved person who becomes demon-possessed, they can be spiritually functional in a demonic sense. But man cannot function spiritually without a spirit, some spirit influencing our spirit, motivating, activating. Our, our spirit must be activated by another spirit, because we're spiritually dead. So it will either be the Holy Spirit, when somebody is born again, or there'll be something demonic. But unsaved people cannot function spiritually. These people that Jude warns about, they don't really understand. Understanding requires the Holy Spirit communicating to our spirit. Okay? Then we understand with our mind because our spirit's been illuminated on the basis of the Word of God. Those people don't have that. They're simply, again, they behave like apes with better DNA. That's what Jude is saying about these people, these carnal people in the church. They think the same as unsaved people. They think the same as highly intelligent animals <laughs> because they're spiritually dead. Now, they're more than highly intelligent animals, but they don't behave like it. They behave like highly intelligent animals, for, for better or worse. They're not highly intelligent animals, but because of the fall of man, that's what they behave like. Okay. They know by instinct the way animals do. Okay. A human will protect its young because of instinct and because of love. A rhino will only protect her young because of instinct. A dog will protect her puppies only because of instinct. Now, a human will have the instinct. That's a function of the soul but it will also do it because of love. But let's continue. And the things that they do understand, they are destroyed. Woe to them, they've gone the way of Cain, for pay they've rushed headlong into the era of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korach. And so we have Cain, Balaam, and Korach. Notice it's always three. Cain, Balaam, Korach. Cain killed Abel. Jesus called Abel the first martyr, didn't he, Matthew 23? Upon you shall be the blood from all the martyrs since Abel. Hevel in Hebrew, Cain.
Cain had the unacceptable sacrifice. He bought his good works, the works of his own trade profession as a horticulturist of grapes of some kind, grower of grapes. But God said, without the shedding of blood, there'll be no forgiveness of sins. Abel bought the acceptable sacrifice. He bought a blood sacrifice. Okay? Those who try to justify their fallen state before God with good works will always persecute those who are justified by the blood. Those with the true faith, based on the blood, will be persecuted by those with a false faith. Okay? Nominal Christians will always persecute true Christians. Other religions, when they have the chance, the BJP in India, Islam, <clears throat> Roman Catholic Church, they will always persecute those who have the true atonement for sin. Cain will always persecute Abel. Those who bring the acceptable sacrifice, which is of course the blood of the lamb, will be persecuted by those who have some other belief system. Okay. But then the second thing that happens is Balaam. One recurrent feature you will see about Balaam is always this. The Rhema thing. Ray and Theo. They are financially motivated. So what if you have people walking from Soweto or Alexandria that don't have 10 rand in their pocket, but they're going to give it to some money preacher who arrives in a chauffeur-driven limousine? This is what it comes to. These guys like Ray McCauley and that, and his, they've always been around. We don't want to go into them, but they've always been around. That's what it's about. But then there's Korach. This is the big one. That unsaved people persecute saved ones. That's encompassed in the being of Cain. That those who are financially motivated will oppose those who have a pure motive. That's a given. But Korach is much more sinister. Let's understand Korach. Turn with me, with these things in view, to the rebellion of Korach in the book of Numbers, chapter 16, please. The man whose prayer God will answer. Verse 1. I'm reading from the New American Standard. The New American Standard and the New English are both very close to the original Greek and Hebrew. Okay, for people who don't know the original languages, both of those are good translations. They're the, probably the best main ones. Now, Korak, the son of Ishar, the son of Kohat, the son of Levi, with Dathan and Aviram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Pelet, sons of Reuben, took action. And they rose up before Moses together with some of the sons of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, chosen in the assembly, men of renown. The worst problems you will have, the worst kind of rebellion against the Lord will be when it comes from leadership, when leaders are selfishly motivated. The worst rebellions are when it's people of renown. When people of renown go off, you got a problem. I saw this stuff 10 years ago when the laughing drunken thing began. I'm sorry to say the pioneer was from your country, Rodney Howard Brown. I'd always thought America was the worst of the worst. But South Africa is just as bad. You produce some real winners. <laughs> the only place I've ever seen as crazy as America for producing heretics and pulpits is South Africa. I didn't think anything could be worse than America, but South Africa is just as bad. Now, I'm not saying they're not some good preachers in America, and I'm not saying they're not good preachers in South Africa, but let's face it. As an American speaking to South Africans, American by birth, we take the cake, don't we? And I saw this thing happen with uh, Rodney, <clears throat> with the laughing drunken thing. What surprised me the most, and I guess I'd have to say hurt me the most, because I saw I would hurt a lot of other people, particularly in England, Australia, people who I always thought were solid, people that were always straight, 
pastors, elders, people in leadership in the church who got caught up in it. I couldn't believe that were men of renown who went with such obviously vile deception. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control, not the lack of it. How can they be caught up? It was the people who got caught up in it. Now, this, this left me very confused at the time. I knew this guy. I knew this brother. I, and I, I, was, I was confused, and many people were confused. They were coming to us. How can our pastor be going with this? And, uh, and I, of course, it drove me to deep prayer, seeking God's wisdom about this confusion. How can this happen? What I believe the Lord showed me at that time, and again, I'm not one of these people who always gets a phone call from God at 2 in the morning, but through prayer and through his word, by the Holy Spirit, God does speak. He does reveal things to us when we seek him on the basis of his word. What I believe the Lord <clears throat> told me, showed me, put it as you want, and I say this cautiously, is it's like when you see these guys run off with the church secretary, when you see a pastor or a minister will abandon his wife and take off with some woman. And I know guys have done that. I know plenty. It wasn't all of a sudden. There was something wrong with that guy spiritually for some time, probably some years, and then something brought it to the surface. Then they went off. <clears throat> but there was something festering, brewing all along. You don't leave your wife and your kids and run off with some, somebody else's wife. You don't do that all of a sudden. Wake up one day, I'm going to backslide and throw my whole life and ministry out the window and hurt my family like this. You don't do that, do that all of a sudden. Something came to the surface that was wrong for some time. Okay. Well, when that, that laughing drunken thing happened, it was the same thing. It simply brought to the surface something that was wrong with these men for some time. If you know a pastor or a minister who went with this, and he always seemed to be solid, there was something wrong with that guy for some time, I'm sure. If the guy was walking solidly with Jesus, he would have seen through it. And of course, we see it, we know by its fruit. Fruit of the Spirit is self-control, not the lack of it, and it did not bring the promised revival. In fact, it's brought decline and division. And these, these, these liars and deceivers who brought people into it have to be held accountable. God will certainly hold them accountable. But let's look. <clears throat> men of renown. When men of renown go into rebellion, you got a problem. Men of renown. And of course, the laughing drunken thing was a rebellion. They rebelled against the word of God. When you pointed out this is not scriptural, fruit of the spirit of self-control, they began saying, you're a Pharisee. They're the Pharisee. They're the one who taught us precepts of God, the inventions of men. But you already know that. I say it only for the tape. And they assembled together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, you've gone far enough for all the congregation are holy. Every one of them, and the Lord is in their midst. Why do you exalt yourself above the assembly of the Lord? They were accused falsely of exalting themselves above the people. Now understand what this means, you have gone far enough. In Old Testament terms, before the temple was built, it was a tabernacle, a tent, okay, where the Holy Ark was. That was the place. The pagans could go this far, okay? The ordinary people could go to here, the court of the women, and that women can go here. The priest could go here. Only the high priest, once a year, could go all the way on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. You've gone far enough. In other words, how close can you get to the ark? <laughs> you understand? It's, it's calibrated in terms of proximity to God's presence, which was in the ark. The ark was made of acacia wood covered with gold because Jesus would be fully human and fully divine. Inside the ark was the law, but the lid of the ark was the mercy seat, the throne of grace that covers the law, and the two cherubs, of course, the two angels that are with Jesus in his ascension and his resurrection and so forth, and in Gethsemane and so forth. How close can you get to the divine presence? You've gone far enough. Only the high priest, Aaron and Moses, were allowed to go all the way. The other Levites could only go this far people down here, Egyptians, non-believers down here, outside completely. You've gone far enough. You've set yourself above the people by saying you're the only ones who can go all the way. But then it continues. 
When Moses heard this in verse 4, he fell on his face. Three times in this passage, Moses falls on his face. When you are unjustly attacked, do what Moses did. The first reaction is not to react to them. If possible, go to the Lord first. First, go to the Lord before you respond to them. Moses fell on his face. You're attacked unjustly. You go to the Lord first. Not to them, to the Lord. Make sure the attack is unjust. Now here it wasn't a just attack. God ordained Aaron. God chose Moses. Remember, Moses and Aaron didn't want the job. The first time Moses came to save Israel, they rejected him. He became a shepherd in Midian. When God chose Aaron to go with him to confront Pharaoh, Aaron didn't want to go. They didn't want the job. Korach did want the job. Be careful of people who chase power. Be careful of people who chase power. Moses and Aaron were put in that position by God. Moses was the most humble man in all Israel. Aaron didn't even want the position. They were there because God put him in it. Now, it's not a wrong thing to desire to be in leadership. Paul says in the New Testament, you desire a good thing. But it's only for God to give, not for man to give. They accused Moses of having put himself in that position, and he didn't. They accused Aaron of having put himself in a position. He did not. And he spoke to Korach in verse 5 and all his company saying, Tomorrow morning the Lord will show who is his and who is holy and will bring him near to himself, even the one whom he will choose, he will bring near to himself. Let God choose, Moses says. Do this, take census for yourselves, Korach and all your company, and put fire in them and lay incense upon them in the presence of the Lord tomorrow. And the man whom the Lord chooses shall be the one who is holy. You've gone far enough, you sons of Levi. You've got close enough to the ark. Why this idea of the incense? You bring your incense, we'll bring our incense, and we'll see whose incense the Lord accepts. Remember Isaiah, a soothing aroma to the Lord? When the people were in sin, God says, I will not smell your fragrances? What does this mean? Turn with me to the book of Revelation, chapter 8, please. Verses 3 and 4, And another angel came and stood at the altar, and holding a golden censer, and much incense was given to him, that he might add to it the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hand. What is incense? The prayers of the saints. Which fragrance will God find a delight using the uh, anthropomorphism, as it were, to his nostrils. Turn with me, please, to Ezekiel chapter 8. Verse 11, and standing in front of them were 70 elders of the house of Israel, with Jehozniah the son of Shaphan standing among them, each man with his censer in his hand, and the fragrance of the cloud of incense rising. Then he said to me, Son of man, do you see what the elders of the house of Israel are committing in the dark? Each man in the room of his carved images, for they say, The Lord does not see us, the Lord has forsaken the land. Here it is the clergy burning the incense. Do not assume because somebody is in ministry that that makes them holy. The ministry is holy. Whether or not the minister is holy is something else. Okay. They were the clergy who were burning the incense. They understood the liturgy. They understood the rituals. They knew what to say. They knew how and when to say it. The biggest deceivers in the world can be backslidden clergy. 
because they know how to cover it up with religion in a professional way. They can, you know, they, they become professional. You're dealing with somebody who's in ministry professionally, full-time. The rest, every Christian's a minister, but not necessarily full-time. But preachers are full-time. They know how to cover it up. A crooked lawyer knows how to shaft people because he can use his professional skills to pull the wool over their eyes, right? He knows how to do it. He can use the law in a way you can't. Well, people in ministry can mislead people quite easily sometimes. They know what to say. They know the words. They know the rituals. They know the incantations. They know how to carry out the ceremonies. They were burning the incense. They were going through all the rituals. So Moses says, going back now to number 16, you bring your incense, I'll bring mine. We'll see whose incense the Lord will accept. Whose prayer will God answer? Let's look. Verse 6, do this, take census for yourselves, Korak and all your company. Put fire in them and lay incense upon them in the presence of the Lord tomorrow. The man whom the Lord chooses shall be the one who is holy. You've gone far enough. Now look what, Lee, look, look what Korak said. All the people are holy. The most dangerous lies are half-truths. Holy means set apart. Sanctified means set apart. In Hebrew, mekudesh. I've pointed out before here in Johannesburg at Elijah Fellowship that the Hebrew word for to sanctify, to make holy, and the Hebrew word to marry is the same word, mekudesh. Remember, Jewish weddings are always different. Christians uh, have 16, for richer, for poorer, for better, for worse. Jews only have one. <laughs> no. You stand under the hoopah from the Song of Solomon, his banner over me is love, and you say from the Song of Solomon, uh, you say from the Hebrew ritual, from the Song of Solomon, the banner, but you say, With this ring I wed thee according to the laws of Moses and Israel. With this ring I sanctify thee. Step on a wine glass. What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. God has sanctified this man to this woman. God has sanctified this woman to this man. He set them apart. There's a play on the word sanctify here. There's a play on the word mekudesh. They're playing on a word. We're all holy. We're all holy. We're all sanctified. Yes, but there is sanctified and they're sanctified. The Jews were a holy nation. They were set apart from the pagans. They were to be set apart from the pagan world. They were all to be set apart. They were all made Kudesh. All of them. All made Kudesh. But being made Kudesh as part of a holy nation doesn't mean you're all married to the same wife or the same husband. It would be like saying, <clears throat> you can come in <clears throat> and practice wife swapping. You can be a swinger. You can sleep around. We can have wife swapping. We're all holy. It's the same word. <laughs> well, if somebody proposed wife swapping, people would know, wait a minute, that's immoral. That's abominable. God could never approve of that. Why? Because God is joined together. He sanctified this husband to this wife. He sanctified this wife to this husband. Well, it's no less an abomination to try to put yourself in a position of ministry or leadership. You must be sanctified to it. What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. It's the same idea. God, he's made it make Kudesh. He has sanctified them to each other. God sanctifies somebody to a ministry. You can't put yourself in it if you do. We're all holy. In God's eyes, that's like no different than saying we can all sleep with each other's husbands or wives because we're all sanctified. That's crazy. Well, it's no less crazy. 
no less crazy. That's how God sees it. The most dangerous lies are half-truths. Yes, we are all holy. We're all set apart. But we're not all set apart to the same ministry or calling any more than we're all set apart to the same husband or the same wife. There's holy and there's holy. But let's continue. Verse 8, Then Moses said to Korach, Hear now, you sons of Levi. These were clergy. Is it not enough for you that the God of Israel has separated you, you and the rest of the congregation of Israel, to bring you near to himself and to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister to them? To bring you near to himself. As Levites, they still could have gotten closer than all the other people. They were quite near to the ark, you understand? They were quite near. God has set you apart. You are much closer to the ark than the other people. Never be envious of another person's ministry or calling. Never. Jesus didn't say you'll know them by their gifts. We always point out, he said, you know them by their fruits. Fruits. I, uh, I'm an evangelist to Jewish people, and I do uh, conferences sometimes with Messianic artists. There's, uh, Jonathan Settel, I'm doing one with him soon, and with Helen Shapiro and people like this. I work with them sometimes. They have fantastic music ministries. This side of the millennial reign of Christ, I am never going to have a fantastic music ministry. I cannot play the piano as well as my wife or my daughter. I certainly cannot sing as well as Helen Shapiro or Jonathan Seto. I just can't do it. I have not been set apart to that ministry. It doesn't mean I don't like the music. It doesn't mean I'm not blessed by the ministry. I am blessed by their music ministry. But when we do conferences together, I expound the scriptures. They lead the worship. They are set apart to it. That does not make me less than them, does not make them less than me. So you got two women in a church. One woman, she is the leader of the Women's Prayer Fellowship or Women's Bible Study Group. And she's on this committee and that committee. And she runs the Sunday school, and God is blessing her, and God is using her, and she's doing all these things in the church. Yes, indeed, thank God for her. But then there's another woman in that church who has a Down syndrome child. That Down syndrome child takes all of her time and all of her energy. She's lucky she can get to church once a week. The kid drives her nuts. She has the grace to take care of that kid. That is her ministry, is to love that child in Jesus. One is not greater than the other. Because God is using somebody more obviously or more conspicuously, it does not make them any less. It is not what the calling is, it is how faithful we are to the calling. <laughs> it's not how many talents you have, it's how faithful you are in using the talents you have. That determines your status. In other words, how much do you love Jesus? How much like him are we? That determines our eternal status. It's not the gift itself, how faithful are we in using the gift? It's not the calling itself, it's how faithful are we in fulfilling the calling. That's the barometer. That's how God measures. That's his plumb line. The world measures differently. Christians should not measure as the world does. Never be, never be jealous of another person's gifting, calling, or ministry. Find out your own and be faithful in that. That will determine your standing in the kingdom, not what the gift is in and of itself. But let's continue. Korak wasn't like that. Korak was two-dimensional. He wanted to rule the roost. He wanted the lion's pride. You know, it's like the uh, baboons. They, the, 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 these apes, they fight each other, don't they? And only the one who's able to beat up the other ones and drive them away from the women, the female ones, he procreates. That's the way that they survive, because only the one who's the strongest his DNA will be the best, so only he would be allowed to, to uh, procreate with, with, with the female ones. Well, <laughs> he wants, you know, so all these guys are going to fight to be the top gun with the baboon. We're not baboons. We shouldn't behave like baboons. 
But there are Christians who behave like baboons. That pack mentality. They want to be the baboon who gets all the girls. Well, they want to be the guy who gets to be the pastor. They want to be the guy who gets to be the big Bible teacher. They want to be the guy who gets to lead the worship. It's not like that in the kingdom. It's like that in the world. But Korak thinks like the world. Again, he becomes the monkey with the better DNA. He reduces himself to that level. But let's look. God's given you all this stuff, but in verse 10, and he has brought you near, Korak, and all your brothers, sons of Levi, with you. And are you seeking the priesthood also? Therefore, you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. But as for Aaron, who is he that should grumble against him? When a leader is attacked, it will either directly or indirectly affect their family. Now again, Aaron didn't want the job. He didn't want the job. If you want a job because God has put it in your heart, if you want it for a right motive, it's one thing. Korach wants power and prestige. Balaam wants money. Therefore, you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. The rebellion was not really against Moses and Aaron. Then Moses sent a summons to Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab. But they said, we will not come up. Is it not enough that you've brought us up out of the land flowing with milk and honey to have us die in the wilderness, but you'd also lord it over us? Indeed, you've not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor have you given us an inheritance of fields and vineyards. Would then you put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. Ooh. Notice something. Moses says, let God decide. You bring your incense, we'll bring ours. Let God decide. Korak says, let the people decide. <laughs> We're doing a conference in England in September with Bill Koenig from the White House, American White House, and David Hawking from the United States. And we're looking at why is democracy disappearing? Well, the reason democracy is disappearing is the founders of democracy in the United States and the United Kingdom understood that for democracy to work, we must be governed by men who are governed by God. Once you are governed by men who are governed by God, democracy will disappear. <laughs> the deification of man, the Supreme Court becomes a supreme being, making politically motivated decisions. Unbelievable. 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 Crazy. You just see what happens. Can you imagine a government minister who's in charge of eradicating AIDS at a country that's being decimated by AIDS? He's the guy in charge. He's charged with rape. He gets off. Some people will say politically. Some people say juridically. I don't know. But he says he didn't get AIDS when he had relations with this woman, forcibly or otherwise, because he took a shower. <laughs> And they, they let him stay in the party and everything. <laughs> this, this will doom a society. This will self-damn a society. Self-damn it. God says you shall not commit adultery. <laughs> Unless you're governed by men, we're governed by God. Once you're governed by men, we're governed by men, democracy will go out the window, the society will turn to chaos. And it's happening in South Africa. And in other countries, but we're here in South Africa now. Let God decide. No, let the people decide. It's not what's right or what's wrong. Who has the best spin doctors? Who can win the election? Who can grease the most palms? Whatever. Says Korah. Okay. Moses.
was God elected, as was Aaron. Korach was self-elected. <laughs> Korach will always falsely accuse others of that of which he is guilty himself. He falsely accuses Moses and Aaron of lording it over the people. Moses and Aaron never lorded it over the people. But you can bet if Korach got power, Korach would have lorded it over the people. But let's look. What he says then, when he appeals to the people, you've not brought us to a land of milk and honey. And he says it twice, verse 13 and 14. We have come out of Egypt in our salvation in 1 Corinthians 10. But we have not yet entered the promised land. We're sojourning in the wilderness. Every lie of the devil today perpetrated at the church in the Western world is to get Christians to trust in this world in some way. We pointed this out before. Kingdom now theology, post-millennialism, purpose-driven, faith prosperity, all of these deceptions are aimed at getting Christians to trust in this life. You've not brought us into a land of milk and honey. No, he's brought us out of a land of Egypt. He's taking us to a land of milk and honey. His kingdom is not of this world. We're king's kids. God wants us rich. If you're not prospering, you're not in God's blessing. That's what they tell people. Now, of course, it's the con artist preacher who's prospering at the expense of the people. The people don't. <laughs> Notice what they do. They try to make material blessing the standard. Numbers chapter 11. Let's look at it. Verse 4. And the rabble who were among them had greedy desires, and also the sons of Israel wept again and said, Who give us meat to eat? We remember the fish we used to eat for free in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, garlic. Now our appetite is gone, and there's nothing but this manna, this manna, for us to look at. Well, the Lord may bless us materially or financially, but even if he doesn't, the manna's going to be there. The money's not going to get you into heaven. The money's not going to get you into the promised land. The manna will. Not mammon, man, manna. They had greedy desires. We remember how good we had it in Egypt. Egypt is a metaphor for the world. It's Satan's kingdom. They were slaves in Egypt. Yeah, when I was in the world, I had a lot of money. I had a lot of money. Guess how I got it? Dealing cocaine. <laughs> Embezzling money with a computer. No. Yeah, so I, made, I made tons of money. I also made money legitimately in the world before I went into the ministry. But... The world's the world. Where and on what basis do they, they get into this stuff? They tried to make material blessing the barometer of blessing. Why does Korach do that? Because that's what the world does. Why do the followers of the faith prosperity people do that? Because they're of the world. They think the way the world does. They use the world's standards because they're of the world. Satan is the god of the world. Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. But let's look. Moses became very angry in verse 15. You see, what you say about me is one thing. But once you begin messing with my family, like Aaron, now I'm getting irritated. Deal with me. Leave my family out of it. But then Korak goes even one further. He attempts to seduce the people. Moses was a shepherd. Hebrew word for shepherd and pastor is the same word in Greek, the same. Episcopal in Greek, Roe in Hebrew. Don't mess with the Lord's sheep. Deal with me. Don't try to hurt the sheep. Don't try to seduce the sheep. Now he blows his top. Say what you want about me. But now you're going after the Lord's sheep. 
I'm his shepherd. You're a wolf. Shepherds are called to shoot wolves, not to mollycoddle them. John chapter 10, Jesus said a shepherd will shoot wolves. You protect sheep, you shoot wolves. But today, they'd rather feed the sheep to the wolves so as to be politically correct. We shouldn't criticize. So what if he's exploiting the poor and prostituting the word of God? Here, Wolfie, Wolfie, have a little lamb. Hey, Ray, you want some lamb chops? No, no, no. You shoot the wolves, you protect the sheep. Now he's messing with the sheep. Let's look. Moses says, I've not taken a single donkey from them, nor have I done harm to any of them. He didn't take anything. He was not financially motivated. He was falsely accused of exploiting the sheep, of fleecing the sheep. But he did not exploit the people. Remember, Korak will always accuse others of what he's really about himself. Moses said to Korak, you and all your company be present before the Lord tomorrow, both you and they along with Aaron. Each of you take his fire pan and put incense on it, and each of you bring his censer before the Lord. 250 fire pans, also you and Aaron shall each bring his fire pan. So they each took his own censer and put fire on it and laid incense on it, and they stood at the doorway of the tent of meeting with Moses and Aaron. That was the showdown. Then Korach assembled all the congregation against them at the doorway. He got everybody lined up against Moses. At the doorway of the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. Hatiferat Adonai, the glory of Yahweh. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them instantly. But they fell on their faces. This is the second time he does it. Falls on his face. They fell on their faces and said, O oh God, thou God of the spirits of all flesh, when one man sins, will thou be angry with the entire congregation? Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the congregation, saying, Get back from around the dwellings of Korach, Dathan, and Abiram. Then Moses arose and went to Dathan and Abiram with the elders of Israel following him and spoke to the congregation, saying, Depart now from the tents of these wicked men and touch nothing that belongs to them, lest you be swept away in their sin. The judgment of God is going to come now, but it's going to come on all the people following them. Moses and Aaron say, Lord, it's only the leaders. It's the fault of the leaders who are misleading them. Show mercy to the people. Please spare the people. It's just the leaders. Get the leaders. They're the wolves. They're the ones. John 10, a hireling will never stand up to a wolf. He's interested in his job, his pay, his hire, his position, his salary. Only a shepherd will stand up to the wolf. Moses says, please, get the wolves, spare the people. Aaron says, please, Lord, spare the people, get the wolves. Whose prayer are God going to answer? So God says, tell the people to get away from their tents. Get away from their tents. What did Jesus say in the book of Revelation? Come out of her, my people, lest you participate in her sins and share in her plagues. I don't suggest for one second that there are not true believers in the Roman Catholic Church. But if you are a true believer in the Roman Catholic Church, Jesus Christ says, get out. You're participating in idolatry, cannibalism, superstition, necromancy. Come out. And I say the same thing to those in Ramah, following the latter-day Balaams, the latter-day Koraks. I say the same to those following little Desmond. Come out of her, says the Lord. Get away from their tents. Get out of those corrupt churches. Get away from them. Who said so? Jacob Prash? No, what Jacob says is irrelevant. 
Get away from the tents of Dathan. Get on the God's judgment. Oh, but all my friends go to that church. Yeah. The church led by a man who divorced a wife, not that she was any bargain, and took off with another one. That's your leader? What does God say? What does Jesus say? I hate divorce. What part about hate don't you understand? If you really love Jesus, you will hate what he hates. He hates divorce. Let's look. Story continues. So they got away in verse 27, back from around the dwellings of Korak. At least they listened to Moses. They got away from the dwellings of Korak, Dathan, and Aviram, and Dathan and Aviram came out and stood at the doorway of their tents along with their wives, their sons, and their little ones. These people are confident, you understand. Korak is confident. You have to understand the nature of these kind of seducers and deceivers. Turn with me very briefly to Timothy, please, to 2 Timothy, just one verse in chapter 3. Verse 13, but in the last days especially, evil men and imposters, imposters, they're pretending to be preachers, <laughs> will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. These men are not just deceivers, they are deceived themselves. That's why they're so confident. They really think because they've been able to get all this money at the expense of fleecing the sheep, that proves God has blessed them. God's with us. They're deceived themselves. They're not just deceivers, they are deceived. These Copeland guys in the States, they are deceived. That's how they can deceive with such confidence. But let's look. Verse 28, and Moses said, by this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these deeds, for this is not my doing. If these men die the death of all men, in other words, if they live to be an old age, die geriatrically, or if they suffer the fate of all men, the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord brings about an entirely new thing, and the ground opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that is theirs, and they descend alive into Sheol, then you'll understand that these men have spurned the Lord. Moses says three, three things here. One, this is not my doing. I didn't want this. Moses did not want the fight. If there's anybody... Everybody is called to be discerning. But if anybody wants to be a discernment minister, you better make sure you're called to, to, to that kind of a ministry like Dave Hunt is. If you want to fight, you're out of your mind. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with unsaved people. I'll deal with Islam, with the Roman Catholic Church, with the Masons, whatever. I hate fighting with other Christians. If you like fighting with other Christians, you ought to have your head examined. God has not called you to that kind of a ministry if you like doing it. If you enjoy it, you shouldn't be in it. But let's look. Moses didn't want it. Secondly, Moses commits himself. If God is not with me, you hold me accountable. If these guys don't die, if God's judgment doesn't come on them, God's not sent me. Don't listen to me either. Only a true prophet will commit himself to that standard. A Rick Joyner never will. Remember when Cindy Jacobs went to Zimbabwe and said it was going to be the garden spot of Africa? What kind of a garden has Zimbabwe become since she gave her prophecy? <laughs> Moses committed himself. He took a stand. False prophets will never do that. Thirdly, we see here a picture of hell. This is where people get the idea that hell is underneath the earth. Even some geologists say that the center of the earth may be molten nickel. I don't know if they're right or wrong. I don't even know if they know if they're right or wrong. But at least this is where we get the image of hell being down. Okay? I'm not saying that's where hell is. I'm saying this is where we get the image of it. This burning place. Down into Sheol. 
So what happens? Then it came about as he finished speaking all these words that the ground that was under them split open in verse 31, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up in their household, and all the men who belonged to Korak with their possessions. So they and all that belonged to them went down alive to Sheol, and the earth closed over them, and they perished from the midst of the assembly. And all Israel who were around them fled at their outcry, for they said, The earth may swallow us up! Fire also came forth from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering the incense. The judgment on the religious people. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Say to Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, that he shall take up the censers out of the midst of the blaze, for they are holy, and you scatter the burning coals abroad. As for the senses of these men, who have sinned at the cost of their lives, let them be made into hammered sheets for a plating of the altar, since they did present them before the Lord, and they are holy, and they shall be for a sign to the sons of Israel. So Eliezer the priest took the bronze censers, which the men who were burnt had offered, and they hammered them out as a plating for the altar, as a reminder to the sons of Israel that no layman who was not of the descendants of Aaron should come near to burn incense before the Lord, and that he might not become like Korak and his company, just as the Lord had spoken to him through Moses. The altar is plated with the censers, hammered out and plated. Remember, the ministry is always holy, not necessarily the minister. They seat themselves on the seat of Moses. As long as what they're telling you is in agreement with Moses' teaching, do what they tell you. Not that they're any good, but the seat of Moses was the seat of Moses at that time. The ministry is holy. The holiness of the ministry does not necessarily depend on the holiness of the minister. God will deal with the unholy minister, but the ministry is always holy. But look at verse 41. The next day, all the congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, saying, you're the ones who've caused the death of these people. Moses just intervenes to save their necks. He falls on his face and asks God not to wipe them out. And then they turn on him. <sighs> Second Timothy, you want to be a pastor? Can you give yourself for people and then have them knife you in the back and you don't love them any less? Second Timothy, that's what it means to be a pastor. Can you give yourself for people at your own expense, have them knife you in the back for it, and still not love them any less. That's a pastor. But in verse 28, Moses said, By this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do these deeds. This is not my doing. I didn't want this. I didn't want any of this. This is not my doing. I didn't want this kind of a conflict. Not my thing. I didn't want this. This is Korak and Dathan. These guys wanted this. I didn't want this. So when it happens, what do they do? <laughs> they blame Moses for something he didn't even want. People's behavior can be completely irrational. When they're not walking with the Lord, their behavior becomes completely irrational. When people are not living their lives in accordance with the Word of God, their behavior and their attitude becomes completely irrational. It's only because of Moses that they're still breathing. But then it continues. Verse 42, it came about, however, when the congregation had assembled against Moses and Aaron, that they turned towards the tent of meeting, and behold, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. Now the Shekinah shows up again. Then Moses and Aaron came to the front of the tent of meeting, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Get away from this congregation, that I may consume them instantly. Now Moses got a real problem. He is not only unjustly accused by Korak, he's unjustly accused by the people. Unjustly accused. 
Only when it was Korach, he was able to say to God, it's only the leaders misleading them. Now he can't say that. <laughs> now he can't say, it's only the leaders, spare the people, it's the leaders, they've been misled. Now he can't say that. People get the leaders they deserve. It's like the sons of, uh, the, 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 the heirs of Solomon. Remember when the kingdom was divided? Jeroboam and Rehoboam. As they say in the States, which bum do you want? Doesn't matter who's going to win the election, the Democrats or the Republicans, it doesn't matter. I'll pray for whoever gets elected, but whoever he is, he's either going to be a Jeroboam or a Rehoboam. Which bum do you want? In the American sense of the word. Britain, it's the same. The same as nations get the leaders they deserve. The reason we have scum as heads of state is because that's what these nations deserve. Once societies turn away from God, they're going to get leaders in accordance with their own nature, character, desire. Politicians will always give people what they want to get elected again. They're not governed by people who are governed by God. They're governed by people who are governed by people. Once you have leaders who are not no longer led by God, no longer guided by the scriptures, <laughs> you're going to have politicians. You're not going to have leaders. You're going to have politicians. That, that spells the death of any democratic society. That spells the death of democracy. It's a country heading for some kind of dictatorship or anarchy. Well, it's the same in the church. Why do we have one conniver after another on the TV claiming to be a preacher? Because we have a materialistic church. We have Laodicea. We have a church who worships mammon, so therefore they're going to get leaders in accordance with their own character and nature and desire. People get the leaders they deserve. Korach never would have come to power had there not been a market for his product. People like Hitler in this, they never get the power unless there'd been a market for it. People like Mugabe, these guys don't get the power unless there was a market for it. Now, the people wind up reaping it. They wind up reaping the consequences of their own decisions. Well, the same as nations will reap the consequences, so will churches. They will reap the consequences. The final victim of Hitler were the Germans themselves. <laughs> The biggest victim of Joseph Stalin was the Russian people. <laughs> the biggest victim of corrupt preachers is going to be the people who sit under their ministry. What's true in the, in, the, in, the, in the political realm is going to be true in the church, ecclesiologically. Same principle. People get the leaders they deserve. But then it continues. Now God's going to wipe the people out. Get away from them, in verse 45, that I may consume them. For the third time, Moses and Aaron fall on their faces. What are we going to do now? Now God is really going to wipe them out. The first time, we could have pinned the whole thing on Korak and Dayton. We could have said they were culpable. They misled the people. We could have put the whole blame on them. Spare the people. It's the corrupt leaders. Spare the nation, it's the corrupt politicians. Spare the congregation, it's the corrupt preachers. But ultimately, the truth always comes to light. Now we can't say that anymore. How can he stop the judgment of God now? Look what he does. They fell on their faces. <laughs> they seek God. This is the third time he does it. Why does God continue to hear his prayers? Then Moses said to Aaron, take your censer and put in it fire from the altar. Now remember, the altar is a type of the cross, isn't it? It's where the sacrifice for sin was made. Lay incense on it. Acceptable sacrifice, the prayers of the saints. Then bring it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them. For wrath has gone forth from the Lord. The plague has begun. Then Aaron took it as Moses had spoken. Now look at verse 47. 
he ran into the midst of the assembly. For behold, the plague had begun among the people. So he put on the incense and made atonement for the people. And he took his stand between the dead and the living, so the plague was checked. But those who died by the plague were 14,700 in addition to those who died on account of Korach. Then Aaron returned to Moses at the doorway of the tent of meeting, for the plague had been checked. Novum testamentum in vetere la tet, the new is in the old concealed, the old is in the new revealed. Aaron is the high priest. Who does the epistle to the Hebrews tell us Aaron is a picture of? Christ, a high priest. What made the wrath of God stop? A high priest from the altar who went between the place of the living and the dead. Where did Aaron go? Verse 47, he ran into the midst of the people. He ran into the midst of the rebels, of the sinners. He who knew no sin became sin. Turn with me to Philippians, please. Chapter 2. Verse 5. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. We will never fully understand the Trinity, the side of eternity. We will understand there is such a thing as the triunity of the Godhead, We'll understand that there is such a thing. We'll understand certain things about the triune Godhead, but we'll never fully understand it this side of eternity. We'll never even understand Christology fully this side of eternity. We'll un we can understand he was fully human. Jesus is fully human and fully divine, but we're never going to understand the divine nature fully this side of eternity. We just understand th that it is so and certain things about it. But let's continue. It's not a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. The high priest had to run into the midst of the rebellious people. Why has the wrath of God not come on Jacob Prash, a campus radical and a former cocaine dealer? Why? because my high priest bought the acceptable sacrifice. He hung on a cross between the place of the living and the place of the dead. Why has the wrath of God not come on you? Why have you not perished, gone down to Sheol? Why are you not on your way to Sheol? Only one reason. Because of the high priest who bought the acceptable sacrifice. He ran into their midst. He who knew no sin became sin. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. Although he had no sin himself, he took ours. Aaron ran into the midst of the people to bring the acceptable sacrifice. That stopped the wrath of God. That is the only thing that can stop the wrath of God. These people knifed him in the back. Even after he saved their necks, they knifed him in the back. But he still asked God to spare them. What was it that made God hear the prayer of Moses and Aaron? What was this thing that they had that every time they fell on their faces, God listened to them? What was it about their incense that was too soothing an aroma for God himself to turn away from? What made them so unique that their prayers were the prayer that God will answer? Not Korah. Yeah. Was it because he committed things to God? Yes, that's true. But that's not the only reason or the main reason. 
Was it because he was elected by God? That is also true, but that's not the only reason or even the main reason. Was it because he did not exploit the people? That is true, but that's just a co-requisite. That he was unjustly accused? Yeah, he was the victim, and God took his side because he was innocent, but even that is not the main reason God heard his prayer. What made God handle him differently? What made his incense irresistible to the Lord himself? What made his prayer the prayer that God will answer is the same thing that will make your prayer and my prayer the prayer God will answer. Being elect, being just, being honest, all that, but something much more than that. The one prayer that God had to answer was the prayer of the high priest. What was that prayer? Yes, they did this. Yes, they did that. They did the other thing. They did it against you, and they did it to me. But I have one prayer. As the honest, innocent victim, I have one prayer. I have one prayer as your elected high priest. Father, forgive. God heard the prayer of Moses because Moses had the prayer of Christ. He never compromised the truth. He never compromised with the wolves. He never held back from calling the shots and calling them for exactly what they were. He didn't compromise one ounce of doctrine. His doctrine was all right. Aaron was the right high priest. He wouldn't give up on his doctrine. He wouldn't give up on his integrity. He said exactly what Korach and Dathan were. But he still said, for these people, Father, forgive. That was the prayer of Moses. That was the prayer of Christ. And if you want God to handle and to hear your prayer. If you want God to see your incense as that incense that's a delight to his nostrils, that will be your prayer. Yes, we get angry at the Koraks and the Balaams and the Daytons. Yes, we get very angry, and rightly so. Moses was correct. But our anger must be eclipsed by the mercy of God. The prayer that God cannot turn down is the prayer of Moses. It's the prayer of Aaron. It's the prayer of Jesus. That prayer, Father. Father.